project that was funded by Northeast SARE, which is a sustainable ag research and education program. Thanks. And, you know, I, I work with dairy farmers. And dairy farmers are like the cows, you know, they're the creatures that have it. So, you know, when I came to Maine, corn silage a certain way, and 20 years later, we're still growing corn silage the same way. So this project really took a different look. And we didn't do any of this research on our experimental farm. We did it all on farm. So we tried to enlist and actually pay farmers to do some of the work that we wanted them to do, and try new things, and try and alleviate some of the risk involved. And really, we're trying to figure out ways to grow corn silage that are going to improve soil quality, and also reduce costs. And really, the reduced cost part was the part that really got farmers interested. Because again, this was happening when fuel prices were going through the roof, and when um, grain prices were going up as well. So this is a joint project, and I work with Heather Darby at the University of Vermont, and Sue Hashimi at UMass. And we all took different parts, and we all used different farms for different parts of this project to look at nitrogen management, look at weed management, look at soil quality. And so, just to give you a quick synopsis of what we found, we had about 30 farmers that adopted no-till corn silage production and uh, used cover crops as well. And, you know, for the period of this project, we had them collect data, and they averaged about, you know, 5.7, 6 gallons of fuel per acre savings by using no-till. And the other part of this, they saved almost three hours worth of labor. So we just we rounded up a lot. But anyway, we rounded out to about $50 worth of savings. And, and you know, that was pretty significant for some of these farmers. So if we can grow corn silage and save 50 bucks an acre and still have the same quality yields, that's going to interest them, get them interested in participating in this program. From my perspective, I do a lot of rations on dairy farms. I looked at a different perspective because you know, if they can reduce their time getting that corn in the ground, get it in quicker, get it planted quicker, this also means they're going to harvest the first cutting of hay quicker. And that really impacts the rations more than anything else, because that quality of first cutting haylage really declines in quality dramatically as the season goes on. So if we can get that corn planted two weeks earlier, get our haylage harvested two weeks earlier, it's going to be my job balancing a ration a lot easier. It's going to save them a lot of money. And then you also potentially have improved cow performance by feeding higher quality rations and higher quality forage. So really that's the part that I like a lot. So this is a standard picture, everybody uses it. This is a Penn State picture. And it looks at you know water quality differences between a tilled field and a no-till field. So this side over here is the no-till corn. This is the tilled corn after a fairly significant rain event. And everybody's used this picture for the past 20 some odd years to say, you know, look at the water coming off of this field, look at the water coming off of this field. Everyone has to grow a corn way using no-till methods to protect water quality. And really that was the impetus for a lot of corn, you know, no-till corn production is water quality. So, you know, that's that's great, but we want to take it a little farther and say, what's the impact on the farm? So we wanted to make sure that we're going to grow corn under no-till system, but we wanted our farms to grow cover crops with it. We wanted to make sure that we also included that other growing season, what I call the back side of the calendar. That corn silage crop comes off in September. We want a grain crop in there that's going to grow from September to November, and then again in the spring. So in a sense, we're trying to you know, farm the whole calendar. We're just growing a warm season annual like corn. We're only going to really grow three or four months of the year. We have that winter grain crop in there that's going to help us quite a bit. But there's a cost to that. It's an establishment cost, it's a seed cost, and what's that going to cost? And for Maine, it costs us about between 30 and 45 bucks an acre to put our crop in in the fall, after corn silage. Depending on seed costs, which arise probably the one most farmers use, the cheapest seed cost. Seed cost. But we want to figure out well, what does that do for nitrogen savings? You know, we potentially say it, but we usually bank on over fertilizing our corn crop. We potentially lose a lot of nitrogen in the fall. After that corn silage crop comes off, a lot of leaching occurs. Is our way to capture it. So Masuda down in Massachusetts did lots of studies looking at nitrogen dynamics in the fall of the cover crop. And they estimated that depending on when that cover crop gets established and how much manure or fertilizer is on the corn crop, the farmers are saving between 30 and 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre by establishing a crop in the fall after corn silage. For 
pretty significant savings if you start looking at it in terms of fertilizer savings. The other benefit we started to see is that these farmers started to grow cover crops. And in Maine, one of our biggest drawbacks of getting on fields in the spring is that our fields are too wet. You know, we could be planting our corn in April, but our fields are usually too wet to even dry them. But we found that we have an active cover crop there. That cover crop is sucking a lot of water out of the ground, and farmers are getting on our fields a lot quicker if we had an actively growing cover crop. The other thing we're finding is that they're actually putting that manure, usually liquid manure from our dairy systems, out on these fields earlier in the spring. That cover crop is utilizing that manure quickly, and it's taking it up. And when we kill that crop, potentially getting that nitrogen back for our so one of the drawbacks we always say is, well, you can't grow no-till corn in the Northeast because our soils are too cold. Anybody hear that before? Anybody know that? So we had this is one of our participating farms in Vermont, looking at soil temperature and soil moisture between cover crop and no cover crop. You see this relatively little difference in terms of soil temperature between cover crop and no cover crop here. And so, you know, <coughs> These are soil temperatures taken in till field with no cover crop, and this is basically a, you know, a no-till field because we have a cover crop growing. And if that cover crop sucking moisture out of the ground, that soil is going to warm up actually quicker. So a no-till system with a cover crop, I think the argument about cold soils is out the window. Just because those soils are drier, the air warms up quicker than water, so we're going to have no difference or maybe even improved soil temperatures with an actively growing crop. This is some of the data from the Sioux in terms of how much nitrogen was saved. And he just compared different cover crop planting dates versus what the PSNT test, which is a pre cypress nitrogen soil test. Do you set up here at all? And take a nitrogen test, corn's 8 to 12 inches tall. Well, we did, we did that with different planting dates on cover crops. And you can see, you know, probably a 30 pound nitrogen savings potentially between an early planted cover crop in September and no cover crop at all. So that's our low value in terms of uh, savings. But we don't have seen other data that shows we have a higher savings of nitrogen in the fall. So, you know, I talked about this earlier, is the fact that it really speeds up planting and harvesting and first cutting hay, which just really is a big impact on the farms that I work with in Maine. It's remarkable how much more Quickly, those farms are able to get out and get that first cutting haylage if we can get that corn planted earlier. So if we can get our corn planted the first two weeks of May without having to till fields, saving all that time in terms of tillage and field prep, it really allows them to get that first cutting off. And that's a significant change in forage quality that's going to impact that dairy system for the next 9 to 12 months. The other thing I like about these systems with no-till and cover crops is it gives the farmer a lot of options and flexibility. Lots of things that they can do. One is, you know, we found that once we start using no-till systems, we have a lot of farmers that say, hey, you know, I haven't had this old hay field that's been in a perennial sod for 30 years. I've never even thought about putting corn silage into it. But if I don't have to pick the rocks out of it, Maybe I can put it in the corn for a year or two to get a better rotation out of it. And so we've had a lot of farmers that have taken old sod fields, killed them in the fall with white sand around them, spread manure on top of those old sods, and then come through and no-till planted corn. Fields that they never would have ever planted corn in before. And that's how really a lot of people got interested in starting using no-till. The other option is the fact that, you know, we're going to plant these cover crops as part of the system. They decided that, hey, you know, maybe in the spring, in May, I may be short of forage. Maybe instead of killing that cover crop, I'll harvest that cover crop as a forage. And that way I can improve my yield, so in a sense get a double crop, because I'm going to come back with corn after that. Or they can even take it to grain. So some of these farmers have said, hey, maybe I should plant a cover crop that's going to yield me a grain that I can use either seed or feed. So maybe I should use winter triticale, which has become really popular, and harvest that as a grain crop that I can feed my dairy cows. So lots of options. So you know, one of the parts was going out and taking some yield. So here's winter triticale. This is May 23rd. 
get about two tons of dry matter per acre for pretty decent high quality feed. It's the flag leaf stage, really decent quality, highly digestible feed. You come through, take that crop off, plant your corn through there, spread the manure on top, and then figure out what you're going to do for weed control. Go from there. So here's an example. It's not the same field, but here's a triticale crop that chopped off at the flag leaf stage, got about two tons of dry matter per acre yield. They applied 4,000 gallons of manure on top of that, and they just planted their corn right through that. So, really a double cropping system. So, what is the what is the drawback on some of these systems? What's been the biggest sticking point? Anybody want to guess? So, I'm saying if you're going to grow no-till corn, you have to grow cover crops as well. So, the real sticking point is, you know, when can I get that cover crop planted if I'm taking my corn silage off in October or even mid to late October, can I get a cover crop established? And so obviously the later you plant, you know, the, the yield of that cover crop, or the ability to maintain good soil coverage is declining quickly. So a lot of our farmers have said, well, I need to grow long variety, long mature corn silage varieties. And our statement is no, you don't. You're actually going to gain benefit by growing a shorter season corn, and they're going to say, well, I'm going to have an impact on my yield of corn silage. So we're going to skip to that and go right to here, because what we do in Maine now is we go through and plant a whole variety of different corn silage hybrids and do a variety test every year. We've done this probably for maybe 10 years now. But we're starting to concentrate on shorter season varieties say and look at the yield of those, look at the dry matter yield, the quality of those corn silages. So we have, you know, a whole crew that comes out and plants. We plant about 40 varieties. We do it three blocks, so we do it triplicate. So. But here's our results from this past year. And this is the effect of relative maturity on this corn silage yield. So short season, long season. You notice there's no line there. There's no relationship. So actually, one of our highest yielding corn silage varieties was a 79-day relative maturity corn. And we've done this in only two years out of the last 10 years have we seen any relationship between relative maturity and yield. So most of the time, there's no line at all. And then, if you go to looking at what's the actual milk yield per acre, because we take the relative maturity and the digestibility of that silage and look at it in terms of how much potential milk can be derived, again, there's no line. And this variety here, the 79-day variety, actually yielded the highest amount of what we predict is milk per acre. And so here we're saying, you know, we grow short season corn. We can start harvesting maybe late August, early September, get a good cover crop established get two crops if you want to take the crop off, the winter cover crop is a feed, make up for any potential loss that you think you might have from growing a shorter season of corn. So, so, you know, that cover crop, again, we always think of it as soil, organic matter, John talked about it as protecting water resources, but it, it is a lot more than that. It's net capturing nitrogen, you know, growing winter grain crops, we always think about that crop actually having some allelopathic effects on weed control of following the crop and improving soil qualities as well. So here's some couple examples. We have a winter rye cover crop. They sprayed it with glyphosate, killed it, spread compost on top of that. Okay. No additional herbicides were used after that. And that's the kind of coverage we get. So obviously, if you're doing the system, you want to come back and, and look and make sure that you don't need to come back with another herbicide application. But in this case, that one application of glyphosate killed that winter rye cover crop and planted right through it, spread the manure on top of it, and got a very good stand. And that's not going to happen every year. And you want to come back and make sure that in the road you've got good weed control as well. But in this situation, it worked. And then soil quality is really important. We're starting to see that. So this is just a picture of, of this part of the field was no tilled with a killed cover crop, winter rye cover crop. This side was tilled. And you can just see where the water ran off the field, where there was no cover crop and it was tilled. Whereas over here, there's no sign of that soil erosion at all. And here's another case where we had a dry year. This side of the field was no-tilled, but a killed cover crop. This side was tilled, and 
no other difference between that. No nitrogen status, because that's usually the first thing you see when you see yellow corn. No difference in nitrogen status. So in this situation, it actually helped us retain water, made that crop more resilient to some weather extremes. So one of the questions we have is, well, what does it actually do to soil quality? John kind of gave an introduction to this. This Solvita test is one that's beginning a lot of popularity in terms of looking at the impacts of microbial respiration on soils. And so if you're interested in this, this is developed by, uh, we'll talk about Haney down in Texas, but it's actually commercially marketed and made by a firm called Woods End Lab in Little Britain. And it really looks at taking some soil samples and doing some basal respiration on them. So we did that with a bunch of soils. So I have these three farmers that all work side by side in a sense. They all farm the same land mass and it's all fine sandy loam. Adam's fine sandy loam. I've got one farm that listens to me really well. So they've done no till for four years now with cover crops. I have one farm that sort of listens to me. And they do conventional tillage, but they're really good at getting cover crop in a year on every year. And I have one farm that doesn't listen to me at all. That's the farm that's grown corn silage the same way for the past 50 years, and they're not going to change. So we took soil samples from them, and we used this Solvita test to look at different changes in the soil. So if you look at this, we see this farm had 7.81 parts per million carbon dioxide coming off. So basically that's an indication of how much respiration is coming off, how much microbial respiration. And you can see as we go from no-till with a cover crop, tillage with a cover crop, tillage and no cover crop, very big differences in microbial respiration. So obviously this soil has a lot of more microbial life. That microbial life is going to do a few things for us. It's going to improve soil structure. Lose the microorganisms release are going to potentially give you better soil structure, better aggregate stability, better resiliency against degree and rainfall. Then there's this measurement, this is called SLAN, and basically it's similar to an amino nitrogen test. And it, you can't really say that there's 390 pounds of available nitrogen in there, but it gives you some indication of what's potentially mineralizable in that soil over time. So if we look at this, this field has about 390 versus 350. So about 40 pounds of difference between the no-till with a cover crop and the till with a cover crop. And then soil organic matter. And even in just four years, and in all these fields were same management up until about four years ago. And they're all the same soils. So here we're at 5.12 soil organic matter down to 3.96. That's a huge change, huge change. Okay, four years of no-till with cover crops. All have liquid manure or compost applied. Very similar systems. So we're seeing some huge differences in soil quality in a fairly short amount of time. So, so how do I get people started on this? I usually go to the old sod group. Say, you've got some fields, you need to grow more corn silage, you need to look at rotations. That rotation effect is really important, and that's one of the things we're starting to see is that Farmers are realizing that you know you can't grow corn silage. We have one farmer, I should say, to tell the story who boasted for years that he'd grown corn silage on this field since 1920. Okay. 1920, continuous corn. Well, he became an organic dairy farmer, not for philosophical reasons, but for economic reasons. And he had to rotate that field. He finally admitted after many, many years that hey, rotation does help. But anyway, we have sod fields that have been perennial sod for years, and people won't switch out of that because of the fact that we have rocks, and they don't want to have rocks, or it's wet or field, a variety of different reasons. But we try and work with farmers to get started on no-till by switching to those old sod fields and say, hey, kill those sods in the fall, use some glyphosate, 2,4-D, spread some manure on it in the spring, plant right through that. And we find we get some great results. That first year coming out of those sods, Great corn silage results. After plant a cover crop, fall after they take the corn silage off, do another year of corn silage, and then another cover crop, and then do the frost seeding that John talked about. Actually, putting red clover in, frost seeding on a winter cover crop in April, and we find that they chop off that winter cover crop and have a perennial sod reestablished, a new perennial sod with a minimum tillage. 
What equipment are you using on that first year? So you still, I think, have a layer of thatch almost after the silage is coming off. So what equipment do you have to get a fall rye down after corn silage? Great question. So what we do, so that's the next question, that's the next slide, actually, I think, is how do we get that corn, so how do we get that winter cover crop established? And so that is one of the issues. Obviously, a grain drill is probably the best way, either a no-till grain drill or a conventional grain drill. But for our dairy farmers, you know, it's, it's getting late, they want to get things done, it's, they don't like doing things slowly, and a grain drill for them is slow. So we looked at, well, maybe we can broadcast with or without some incorporation, minimal incorporation. I'll show you one technique. We're looking at potentially aerial seeding some of these cover crops into the standing corn silage crop, so that when they harvest the crop, we get some incorporation. And then maybe side grass, and then um, Michigan State's done a bunch of actually doing slurries where they actually put the cover crop seed in the manure tank, put an agitator in there and spread a little manure on top of the corn stubble and establish the cover crop that way. But here's some of the things. So one of the farmers rigged up one of these, to, now this is just in, where they stored it, it's not the cover crop. One of those flexible time harrows, and they made it about 30 feet wide, and this farm actually goes out and uses a fertilizer spreader to spread the cover crop seed and then come right behind with this flexible tying harrow and actually get decent establishment. This is a cover crop that they established on their field using that technique. It works pretty well. Very, very fast. Just a slight incorporation. So, um, some of the grain corn growers have decided to put on a cover crop applicator that goes on right behind the harvester. So that's one technique. Um, this is, I stole this from a Pennsylvania demonstration where they actually had these um, computerized robots with a GPS unit on it that's narrow enough to go in between the rows of standing corn. Obviously there's some limitations here because that seed box doesn't contain much seed, but it's a potential option of trying to spread seed through the cover crop or through the standing corn. This is the one I think has a, top, a lot of potential as well, is getting the cover crop seeded through high-rise tractors. We have a bunch of high-rise tractors that are used for custom herbicide applications in Maine now, and if we can get them ever to think about using these same type tractors for putting cover crop seed on standing corn, I think that would help quite a bit. And then finally, we have a lot of interest in this because it's very quick, and that is the helicopter seeding. Um, so, Usually the helicopter seeding is, is one that works relatively well if you have a standing crop. If you've got a good pilot, you do really well. If you've got a bad pilot, you do really poorly. So <laughs> it really depends on the pilot. Um, we tried this with planes. We had a lot of worse luck with planes. Helicopters work much better. They can find the right fields. They can land right next to the fields or reload it versus a plane that may or may not land. Um, plane pilot we used many years ago had trouble finding the right fields, so some fields got seeded when they shouldn't have been, and vice versa. But what are some of the drawbacks of this? It's not all pluses. Some of the drawbacks, you know, we have a real push now for non-GMO products or GMO labeling in the United States. So if dairy farmers aren't able to use Roundup Ready corn, that's going to limit their ability to use no-till systems. So, Heavy soils. Will no-till systems work in really wet soils? I say yes, but there are some people who are saying, well, you know, you're going to have to modify your planters, make sure that slot closes well. In the really wet soils, is that seed going to rot if it's cold and not tilled? So we're working on that one. Manure management. So I wrote manure management laws for Maine so like 15 years ago. <coughs> Got to incorporate no, you've got to incorporate no, well, Now I'm the no-till guy and say you don't incorporate manure, you put it on top. So I have a little trouble with that, but we're finding, you know, obviously if you spread manure on top of the soil, you're gonna get some volatilization and loss of nitrogen. I'm gonna give you that. But I'm also saying that if you spread that manure on an actively growing cover crop, you're not gonna lose nearly as much if you spread it on bare ground. And one of the things we find is, you know, our government spent a lot of money building these manure storage structures for dairy farms, which are great. You know, they don't spread year round anymore. But the problem is, 
we've got to empty the damn things in October and November to make it through the whole winter. And so where do they put the manure? They spread it on corn around bare fields. To me, that's disposal. It's not utilization. So if they spread that manure on a cover crop field, at least you get some utilization. Ruts in the field. You can't deal with ruts in the field. If you've got no-till system, you go harvest that corn and it's wet. You get lots of ruts developing in the trucks or compacting the soil, making two-foot ruts. You know, that's not going to work in a no-till system. So there are some challenges there. The other things we've seen in the past few years seems like our fields that are cover cropped and no-till seem to have a preponderance of army worm invasions. That actively growing cover crop was really lush to those army worm moths when they fly in. That's a potential problem. So we need to scout for that. And then northern corn leaf blight has really been an issue for us this past growing season. So if we're doing no-till or advocate for no-till, you know, there's a lot of corn residue on the ground. That's the inoculum for northern corn leaf blight. So we need to think about that and then, you know, draw people towards using resistant varieties of corn, especially in the systems. So with that, I'm going to open up for any questions or comments. you get your uh, corn cottage dried down to like, some kind of cover crop? So we, we suggest that we want farmers to harvest corn silos between 32 and 35 percent dry matter. <coughs> I can guarantee you that if they're growing a 95 to 105 day corn silage variety, that's never going to happen in Maine. It will happen, but it will happen after it's frosted. Okay. So that's what a lot of our farmers say. Well, I can get it down there, but it'll be after a frost. And I'm going to say, well, you've lost a lot by letting it get frosted. If you grow that 79 day corn and harvest it at the end of August, beginning of September, you're going to have it at the right moisture content. You're going to get better fermentation in the silo. You're going to get better adaptation by the cow to that feed. The starch availability and fiber digestibility is going to be much better. So there's a lot of advantages for growing that short season corn. Less leachate coming out of the silo, I could go on and on. But, you know, that long, people are drawn to those tall plants for those 110 day corn. I can't figure out why. <coughs> really, what they need to look at is what's the quality of that meat, not just the quantity. But we look for, we try and get it to 30, 35%. Thank you. Yeah? Thank you. What would the normal planting be? Our normal planting window for corn silage runs anywhere from the 1st of May to the 15th of June. Pretty big window depending on weather conditions. So that's our normal planting. Yeah. When, when you're going into the old sod grounds, corn or whatever crop for the first time, have you seen any evidence of wire work issues? Or is that we haven't seen that. You know, John and I have been talking about that. We haven't seen that. Uh, we're, we're getting real nervous, though. Yeah, we're, Let we're me tell you, we're getting really nervous. Too, we're going to take this message home with us. Trust us. And you know, some of our best corn silage has been on those old sod grounds the first year. You know, no till system. You got it. It's really important to kill that sod in the fall, though. It makes it much easier to work with. And, and make sure you use a little 2,4-D when you kill the sod. Like to say, well, it's just not going to take care of the problems. Thank you very much.